Welcome everybody to Community Science Saturday. This this week, this today, we're going to learn all about the purple martins. The purple martins are a bird, and we're going to learn from Ken Ritter, who is um, the leader of the Purple Martins Club at Calvert Marine Museum. Um, uh, I found them and I said, I didn't know anything about purple martins. And the more I started reading, the more fascinated I became with the bird. And I hope that you will too. Um, but I, I don't want to step on anybody's toes. Ken has a lot of information to share with us and I can't wait to learn from you, Ken. Thank you so much for agreeing to share your, your knowledge, expertise and passion for the Purple Martins. Well, thank you for having me. So, um, and uh, I'm, I'm Ken Ritter. Um, I've been um, hosting colonies of Purple Martins for about 30 or 35 years now, I lost track. So, but um, the Calvert Marine Museum has a lot of um, school kids who come to during the school year for uh, tours and for learning processes and stuff like that. So um, I went to the museum and I asked if we could put up some bird boxes at the museum and the hopes of educating um, the, the youth that visit Calvert Marine Museum. Um, just to, and so we actually, you know, got some grants. We were able to put up some, we were able to put up a box right near the Drum Point Lighthouse. And we also have a box at the Cove Point Lighthouse, which is uh, a private lighthouse that's owned by the Calvert Marine Museum. But uh, if you're ever looking for a great place to stay, they have the keeper's house, which um, um, they rent out on a week or weekend or whatever basis. So just, uh, and it's right on the Chesapeake Bay. So, but let me start with Purple Martins. Um, the most important thing about Purple Martins is that they are 100%. 100% dependent on man for their housing and to reproduce. So if we don't put up housing or boxes or gourds, in my case, I use gourds, um, they will not reproduce. So, um, so they have become acclimated to man, then they depend on man. And so, uh, and this didn't just start recently this actually started with the native american indians uh, who lived on the shores waterways the whole way up and down the east coast and the purple martins that we have here in maryland are only east of the mississippi there's another whole gender of purple martin um they don't even call it purple martin they just call it a martin that is on the west coast so most of the purple martins we get here in the East Coast, typically from Texas, Florida, on north, clear up to Canada, um, they, uh, they spend only about three or four months here in the United States. And then they fly across the Gulf of Mexico or down around the Central America or down to Florida and they uh, stay in Brazil for probably about six months of the year. Uh, we don't know a lot about the birds that are in Brazil and what they do in Brazil, but we do know that that's where they go. Um, the, uh, we do have some uh, tracking things that we are using right now. Some people are, they call them geo trackers. They're not like, uh, GPS trackers. Uh, the geo trackers work that they have to capture the purple martin while they're here. They put the geo tracker on them. It goes under their wings and it sits on the middle of their back and it weighs about less than an ounce. And then when the birds fly back to Brazil uh, and they stay there, and then they, we have to recapture them when they come back to. To the United States, and then um, they 
can download the data off the geo tracker. Now, I don't know how it all works, something to do with the sun and, and the curvature of the earth and all that good stuff. Uh, so then they can track where the birds have been, how long they've stayed, uh, that kind of stuff. So it's still only on a small scale right now because it costs about uh, $200 per geo tracker. So, so you have to get some grant money. You have to, you know, raise some funds to be able to do this. So, and it's a lot of commitment because uh, the people who are doing the geo trackers, they have to catch them while they're here. Then they catch them again when they come back. So, um, so it makes it's it's some dedicated people doing some dedicated work so but but purple martins are uh, very social very friendly um they eat lots of bugs um the old wives tale though is that they all eat a lot of mosquitoes which really isn't true because <laughs> Purple martins don't feed close to the ground. That's where you normally see the swallows and those kind of birds. They eat a lot of mosquitoes. Purple martins actually feed anywhere from a mile to five miles high. Uh, so they eat all kinds of other bugs. One of their favorites around here is dragonflies. They, I mean, they got they catch these dragonflies that are about the half the size as they are, and uh, and that's what they feed their babies. So most purple martins, especially in Maryland, arrive around April. Um, maybe the last week of March. I've never had them any earlier than that. But but with the weather, you know, it all depends on the weather. They they typically come across, you know, in January or February, and uh, that was really bad for them this year those who were migrating north uh because texas and louisiana and oklahoma and all the places had snow i mean a cumulative snow feet of snow and a lot of the migrating birds all songbirds the uh, the uh, had froze to death while right after they came across so because there was nothing to eat. So if they, you know, they're dependent on bugs and if there's no bugs and it's cold, uh, then that's that's a sorry state for the those birds who are coming across on the migration route. So so that was a bad year. This was a really bad year for especially for purple martins. We I've been reading reports where landlords Purple Martin landlords have lost hundreds and hundreds of birds that froze to death. So, but, and the, the mortality rate, excuse me, of a Purple Martin, uh, once the, they get here, they, they rate, mate, uh, they build nests in the boxes we provide. I use gourds um, and um, they're, I was doing natural gourds, but now I do plastic gourds, less maintenance. The older I get, the less I want to <laughs> play games with that. So, but, uh, and I mean, if you are interested in becoming a Purple Martin landlord, um, the, um, I, I would just, I would suggest to check out the uh, Purple Martin Conservation society um uh they are it's www.purplemartin.org and uh, they have everything you want to know about purple martins uh and you can buy buy a box actually the wild bird centers sell purple martin boxes actually tractor supply sells purple martin boxes uh for about a hundred dollars with a pole and a purple martin box you can get started um and um uh, but be you it's one of these you got to be patient type thing because they don't know where you are so they have to fly over and spot your box so the hope is then this is something that you would also buy it's called 
Dawn song for Purple Martins. And, you know, if you're trying to attract Purple Martins, you play this CD, uh, especially early in the morning for at least a couple hours. Uh, that way they can hear other Purple Martins and they will come and investigate um, your box. The other thing to use is Purple Martin decoys. Uh, so they hear the birds, they come and check it out. And if you have a decoy, you know, it looks like a bird sitting there. So um, so they, that um, that's one way to attract them. But uh, I can almost guarantee you, you probably will not get Purple Martins your first year. Um, and if you're gonna do it, you got to be patient. I've got some people that I've been working with probably for seven or eight years. Uh, they're doing everything right. They're doing all the same stuff, but still haven't got any purple martins. So, but once you get purple martins and they nest and they have babies and they fledge, um, the likelihood of them coming back to the same nest is about 80 or 90 percent. But the mortality rate is only about 50%. So about 50% of the birds that hatch and fledge uh, do not make it back the next year just because they're flying across the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and you know you don't know what the weather is there and you don't know what the weather is like in Brazil where they spend the winters. So, so playing the patience game is kind of tough sometimes with Purple Mart, but I have found that they're one of the most rewarding birds to have around. Uh, they make beautiful music. Uh, they, um, I mean, they're, they love being around people. I mean, you don't have to put your box way out in the middle of a field somewhere where it's away from people. I mean, I have mine about 30 feet from the side of my house. Uh, the big thing is don't put it too close to trees uh, because then you, that's the trees will attract predators like hawks and owls and uh, stuff like that. So um, so that that way, you know, you don't I keep mine close. I have a big I have two benches sitting in my front yard. So in the evening, especially when they're coming in to go to to roost. Uh, I sit there and I watch them and I listen and and uh, it, it is a real joy and I've been enjoying it for a long time. So um, and that's what a lot of people have said when they go to the Calvert Marine Museum that especially during the summer, um, it's great. They can sit right underneath the lighthouse at the Calvert Marine Museum and watch the Purple Martins fly around and sing and stuff like that. And so um, so it's a once you get purple martins it's very worthwhile and uh, and it's not a lot of work uh you you do check the birds that's why you got to have a telescoping pole or a pole that's on a pulley that goes up and down because you want to check them i mean i check mine once a week um you know and i check the babies i you know once their eggs once and once the babies are born i check the babies to make sure they don't have any kind of mites or bugs or anything like that. And, you know, if they do, you, you clean out the box and you put new material in and, uh, and um, they, you know, they're happy, you know. So, you know, I try to tell the kids that old wives tale of your mom and dad used to tell you, don't you touch those babies in the nest or the mother won't come back. Well, that's an old wives tale. So, I mean, purple martins are, have to be checked regularly. Uh, fact is, my my purple martins. Uh, I just had two nests fledged this week, uh, so they're flying around, learning how to fly, and the parents are just making all kinds of noise talking to them. So, uh, so but probably by the end of August, they will be gone. It's just like uh, a switch goes on, and all of a sudden. They fly to these big, big roosting areas. There's several of them in Texas, some in Louisiana, some in Oklahoma, some down in North Carolina. 
and millions and literally millions of purple martins will congregate there and they will it's like they're gathering and then one day they like i said the light goes on and they're gone they're flying across the gulf of mexico so um and if you've never seen a million birds flying around coming into roost it, they they can track it on weather satellite weather radar and it looks like a tornado coming in and uh, them flying around and um th they you know it, it is something to see i actually went down to uh tennessee and saw a purple mountain roost and uh it wasn't a very it wasn't a big one like some of the other ones but i mean we're talking you know thousands of birds coming in to roost and then they stay for three or four days and then boom they're gone so it is a um it's not some it's it's something as man we need to do because without our assistance they will not survive so um so that's why i, I try to educate as many people as i can to let them know um, that, you know, this is something you can do as a family. This is something you can do as a group. You know, uh, I do it. I help out anybody. So if now's too late to put up a box, but come February and early March next year, if you'd like to put up a box or uh, whatever, um, please go on the website at the Calvert Marine Museum and look me up. My phone number's there. Give me a call. I will help you any way I can. Uh, and I don't mind driving somewhere to help you. Um, so, and help you get set up. Um, so it's a, you know, to me, it's a very worthwhile cause. Uh, and I think that we need more people to do it. So, and that's why essentially why I try to educate the, the kids because the kids are normally the ones that start saying mom dad let's do that you know and it can be a family operation because all my granddaughters and even my kids when they're growing up uh, my granddaughter especially still help me now um, they help me put up the box put up the gourds they help me uh, count the eggs when they're born they help me count the babies when they hatch uh, we measure measure the babies and see how old they are. Uh, these are some of the pictures that you can buy on the website. It shows, you know, the, and there's a procrastinator that can show you when they were born or when they hatched and uh, how long they will be until they fledge. And then, then it shows, then you can see how old they are by looking at the pictures. So, and then just so that you know what a purple martin looks like, here's some pictures of purple martins. Okay, this is a male purple martin, of a mature male. It takes the males roughly about a year, year and a half for them to get uh, their purple, all their purple feathers. And this is a purple martin female. Um, you can always tell the male always has the great, the great uh, colors, and so, but uh, they both raise, they both build the nests, they both uh, raise the youngs, um, and so uh, they are very mutual in uh, raising their family. So, uh, but uh, it is something that. Uh, I would recommend if if you are all bird lovers, I would recommend that you you know get involved. I mean, uh, and you don't need a lot of property to do this. You don't need you know a lot of money. Um, and if you go online or even check out the Wild Bird Centers, uh, they sell boxes there for you know less than a hundred dollars and a pole you can get for thirty or forty dollars. And uh, you can be set up for next year. So, uh, but um, uh, hey, Ken, we so, have a couple. We have a question. If you can yes, the question. Melinda yes. 
Yeah, Melinda wants to know, um, she has hawks and an owl family in the woods behind her house. Should she avoid <laughs> trying to establish a martin colony? Well, the owls are probably the worst uh, because the purple martins are in the box at night and they can't see the owl coming. Hawks, purple martins are very defensive. Um, so uh, if a hawk does start flying around, it's all hands on deck and the purple martins, uh, like other birds that attack the hawks, uh, <laughs> try to chase them away. That's not to say that you might lose some. But the owls are the worst. Um, they do make owl guards that you can put on your purple martin box so that the owl can't land on the box and reach their leg in to grab the purple martins, you know. So uh, the purple martins can't see them coming at night. So, but, but yeah, that would be a little rough. I would, um, I would have to speculate on that one because, uh, because, Hawks and purple martins and owls uh, just, you know, they 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 don't get along. <laughs> so, but uh, I was going to mention, I forgot to mention, and I'm sorry that the reason that uh, purple martins are acclimated to man, like I said, started back with the Indians. Um, they would, and it's been documented on when the pilgrims and those people who came across in the 1600s, they, you know, the Indians would have natural gourds that they grew hanging from, from rope across their gardens to attract the purple martins. So, um, and it became so commonplace that the purple martins now, uh, you, you, they don't nest in trees, they don't nest and uh you know you might see some in a light in a light box somewhere or something like that or maybe i've seen them where they were in a uh like a building sign you know like on a walmart sign inside the the the, the sign but the majority of them have to have some kind of box or gourds to for them to build nests and so and they become used to it. So, um, but it's a, uh, it's something else. So does anybody else have any questions? I have a question, uh, uh, Ken. Um, you mentioned, I, I read that uh, the average age of the folks that are have the houses, um, the landlords uh, is getting up there. And so yes. that's why they're trying to get a new generation of folks to, 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 to be landlords. Is there a secondary market for um, Purple Martin houses so that, you know, if you don't want to buy them brand new, can you buy um, used ones? That's a good question. Um, typically, people that have tried to raise Purple Martins and are unsuccessful, they just give up. And then if they know me, they give me a call and I go and salvage their boxes. Okay. I probably have four or five sitting up in my top of my shed right now. But, um, you know, uh, if I get a used box, I don't sell it. I give it to somebody. So, because I want them to try it, you know, so, um, but I've never heard uh, of anybody advertising, but you never know. Um, so people people have them and then they just they just don't take them down even if they don't get purple martins and which is sorry because then the uh, starling the scourge bird of the world uh, take over or or house wrens um, they 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 nest in the purple martin box so especially the ones like over at Calvert Marine Museum I'm constantly going over there and cleaning it out the house wren nests that are in there um, because they'll nest in the same box. Most of the time the purple martins don't care, but but when it come in the when they're starting just nest, I want more purple martins than nests, not wrens. So, you know, or, or house sparrows. So uh, so I clean the nests out. So so that's why you check your boxes periodically. But I bet if you advertise you know, on something like, you know, we have a thing called Southern Maryland Online. 
which is um, like a marketplace thing. Uh, people put everything on there from yard sales to cars to whatever, that if you were looking for something or a used one, uh, I, you know, I, up, up in Baltimore or wherever you're located, I bet, I bet people have boxes that they're no longer using. They just got them up in the air and they tried to get Purple Martins and they were unsuccessful and they, they still have them. So uh, it might be something to advertise on your own. So um, you're right. The, you know, the older generation are the people who are typically doing it right now. Uh, that's why I've been trying to educate some of the youth uh, to try to get them started. And um, so it, it, it's a long uphill battle as far as that's go because youth nowadays are too much concerned about their PlayStation or their online videos and stuff like that than to try to take care of some Purple Martins, you know, or any other birds. So, um, but but I would try to advertise and say, see if anybody uh, has a box that they want to get rid of. So, uh, and that would probably save you some money. So, uh, Melinda has another question. Does the Purple Martin Conservation Center register and track the yep. sites that have yep. the boxes? Every, and that's another reason why you check your, 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 take your box down and check it. They have a, a spreadsheet that they track uh, you know, how many pairs you have nesting, how many nests you have, how many eggs are born, how many babies hatch, and how many fledge. And they keep all, they want you to turn in that data, and they keep track of all that uh, on a website. So you can go and check, and especially for your area, you know, you, and you can also find out in your area who else is uh, raising purple martins, uh, and then they also have a um, a um, website where you can go to once your purple martins arrive to track where they're at as far as moving up the moving north, and so they um, so you can go in and, and log in. Well, my purple martin showed up today, you know. Uh, and you know, spotted three mature males and two females. You know that type of data they keep track of. So then you can search, like in Maryland, like in April, I'll go and search in Maryland and, and see see where they're at. Who has who has purple martins already? So that I know mine are coming pretty soon. So so I can be ready and. Uh, so yeah, they track all that data. They're the, also the ones that do the geo tracking stuff. Uh, they've got some interesting articles on the geo tracking stuff that you know shows how long it took them to fly from you know the coast of Florida to to Brazil. You know how many hours it took, how many miles it was, and they can track all that stuff. So and then they can because we have nobody down in. Brazil tracking songbirds or any kind of birds for that matter and Brazil's a big area so so they can track by the geo tracking they can track where they've been or how long they stayed when they started to fly back north all that stuff so uh, but it's it's pretty tough because you can't track it until they come back so but other than that um, but they can keep all that data and uh, they're actually out of uh, Erie, Pennsylvania, the, the Purple Martin Conservation uh, Association. They are, um, and they don't get their birds back until like the end of May almost because, you know, they're flying clear up to Pennsylvania. So, uh, but they have, they probably have a, a thousand boxes up that they maintain. This organization does, and so uh, they do a lot. They have full-time people that's do that's all they do is track purple martins. <laughs> so I said I want that job. So, but 
But anyway, so. He said that it didn't matter where you put them. Um, I mean, can it be in a suburb? Can it be in an yep. urban area? Can it be in a, in a rural area? Anywhere. So long as long as it's not too close to a tree, they recommend 20 or 30 feet from a tree. Uh, I've got people I know who have, have their purple martin box like 10 feet from their deck on the back of their house. So, and uh, so, yeah, it, it, but you know, the issue becomes then, can they see your box from the air? To, so you can attract them. But once they find it, then, then you're okay. They would, they normally keep coming back to the same box. And I, I used to ban my Purple Martins. I used to have a, a bander who, um, I live near the Patuxent Naval Air Station. Uh, he worked on base, but he wasn't authorized no more to come out outside off the base to ban birds. So, um, and I, I tracked my birds for many, many years. I had the same birds come back five and six years. So the adults, so, uh, so it, it, you know, you, you can track them that way too. If you know somebody who does banding, uh, they, they can, um, track the purple martins you know i mean ban the purple martins and that way you can tell if they come back the next year so all right does anybody have some more questions for ken about purple martins and becoming a purple martin landlord and and seriously i um my email is on the calvert marine museum website my phone number don't I? I'll take calls and emails from anybody. Believe me. So, uh, if you want to learn some more, uh, please give me a call. Um, and it's not—I mean, it's too late for this year to try to get Purple Martins, but it's not too late to start planning for next year already. So, I mean, uh, just like anything else, if I got a bluebird trail on my property, uh, you know, you got to clean out the bluebird stuff, you know, just like purple martins, you got to clean out the, the purple martin nests, you know, so, um, so you have to maintain your stuff. So, um, but, uh, but I will, I'd be glad to talk to anybody, seriously. So, any more questions? More questions. So. I, I think, well, I think uh, I'm excited about trying to set some up and uh, I hope that everybody else is as well so that you may have con uh, some new uh, Purple Martin converts and landlords. Uh, Boy, in. Wonderful. I, I love it. Seriously. Uh, um, like I said, they're one of the few birds that's dependent on us. So, and um if we don't do something, then, you know, it won't happen. So, and that's why, so it's a good way. Like I said, I got my granddaughters who help me. And, uh, and so it, it becomes a family thing. So. All right. Well, I want to thank everybody for joining us and thank you, Ken, for sharing your experience with the um, Purple Martins with us. And I know that uh, thank you for opening up yourself for future questions. If folks want to get more involved, um, they'll know how to contact you and maybe we can all kind of stay together. If you do set up and want to set up a Purple Martin um, house, let us know so we can uh, uh, maybe have our own little club here with the Natural History Society of Maryland um, and yep. see how people are, are doing as well, just like they do down at, in Calvert uh, Marine Museum. Um, if there are no more questions, everybody enjoy the rest of your weekend. It's a beautiful day out there. Get outside, um, look at some birds and yep. uh, start planning for next spring. Yep, I, I hope you do, seriously. And again, Give me a call. I will help any way I can. So. All right. Thank you so much. We'll take care, everybody. Stay Thank well. Thank you. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye.